we're holding and we're going. All right, so I'd like you all, I'd like to welcome you all to our panel. Um, we do have this uh, as a queer inclusion event, uh, especially discussing uh, affirmation and acceptance within churches, specifically from the perspective of clergy members within the church. Um, to begin, I just want to let you know that the way this panel is going to work is we have a set of questions to ask for the first half, um, and then the second half is going to the second half is going to be questions from you all. So if you are listening and you hear something and you want a clarification or something along those lines, um, I would go ahead and send it in a chat. Those chat messages are just going to go to me or Emma, um, and we will write those down. We're going to take a brief intermission about 30, 40 minutes in, discuss what our questions are going to be, organize that, come back, and we will do some more audience questions. Um, again, if you have any questions that you want to ask, go ahead and send those in the chat at any time. We'll be able to see those and start organizing them um, before we get started. Let's see, I am going to go ahead and unmute all of our participants because as we've discovered, um, only Emma and I are allowed to unmute people. So panelists, if something happens that is rather loud, um, go ahead and mute yourselves and then ask us to unmute when need be. But if you would feel comfortable to do so, if you're in a space that's not too loud, you can also just keep yourself unmuted. Um, but I do ask our audience members to keep yourself muted the entire time. All questions need to go through the chat. Any um, questions from panelists before we get started? I'm gonna go ahead and introduce people. Awesome, um, I'm Mackenzie. I probably should start with that. I use she, her pronouns. I am a co-lead of the Queer Christian Club on Western Washington University's campus. And I'm really excited for this evening. Um, I'm gonna pass it off to Emma and then we're gonna pass it to David and then go all the way down the line of all of our panelists. So Emma, you wanna take over? Hi, I'm Emma, they them pronouns. Uh, I'm the other co-lead for the Queer Christian Club. Uh, and I'm really excited for this panel. Uh, I'll pass it to David. Okay, I'm unmuted. Hello, uh, my name is David. I use he, him, his pronouns. I'm the pastor for Youth, Young Adults, and Mission at First Congregational Church of Bellingham, which is a United Church of Christ um, congregation here in town. Um, it's a joy to be with you all. I also serve as the advisor for the Queer Christian Club, which is an honor. And um, yeah, I, I think that the Queer Christian Club is doing really important and fun and interesting work. And I'm really glad to be here with some of my wonderful uh, affirming colleagues in town. Um, I'm queer and bisexual myself, so this work is near and dear to my heart. Uh, and I guess I'll talk more about my congregation later on. Um, I'm going to pass it to Sharis next. Hi, David, you look like you're in a game show. It's cracking I'm me so up. excited. <laughs> pick me, pick me. Um, my name is Sharis Weathers. I am the pastor of a very small, funky little church plant here in Bellingham called Echoes. And I am also the interim pastor of a more traditional congregation down in Arlington, about an hour south of here. So I am bisexual as well. I'm in a relationship with a phenomenal woman who does not go to church. And so this is good stuff for me too. Thanks. I'll pass it to Joel. Okay. Uh, my name is Pastor Joel Langholtz, and I serve a congregation in Bellingham, our Savior's Lutheran Church, and also a uh, pastor Lutheran campus ministry at Western uh, and I am grateful to be added to the group. I, I feel like I look like I might be in a 70s Polaroid or something. <laughs> the light is not very good. but It's a good look for you, Joel. It works. <laughs> I am going to pass to Lindsay. Hi. My name Oh, 
Uh, sounds like Lindsay might be trying to get her technology together. Kathy, do you want to go ahead? Sure, sure. I'm Kathy Hargraves. I'm pastor of Garden Street United Methodist Church downtown. Um, we are a reconciling congregation and have been for a number of years and have a, a robust college ministry with three quarters of them are gay. So it's just been a real, it's a real quite, it's quite an ama amazing experience. I'll put it that way. So it's been really, really great. So that's who I am. I don't know if that means any more, but. <laughs> right. Um, while Lindsay is figuring out technology, does anybody feel comfortable introducing Lindsay really fast? Uh, I, yeah. Um, Lindsay is a wonderful pastor. She serves at St. Paul's Episcopal here in Bellingham. She also serves uh, for EPIC, which stands for something, but it's the Episcopal Campus Ministry. And so she does really cool ministry both in town and on campus. Hmm. All right. Um, while we're waiting on that, I'm going to go ahead and get us started. Um, we're going to open up with talking about uh, accepting churches, specifically just accepting. We're going to move on to affirming churches right after this. Um, David, can you start us off by answering, like, what makes a church accepting? Yeah, I guess, uh, so, so that means different things for different congregations. One of the things I look for in a congregation is, um, what does the fullness of ministry look for LGBTQ plus people? Um, I think it's one thing to welcome folks to come and uh, be part of the worship. Um, but it's another thing to invite people into the fullness of ministry, to celebrate folks' marriages, um, to baptize folks' kids, to uh, or bless folks' kids, to uh, have people serve as part of the leadership team of the church, and to ordain LGBTQ plus people. So um, at my church, we do all of those things, and that's really lovely. Um, that's been a part of our ministry for about the last 20 years. Uh, but, but like I say, it, it looks different at different congregations. And I just got a text from Lindsay that she's having tech trouble, but is going to call in. So, yeah. Sounds good. Do um, any of our other participants uh, have perspectives on what an accepting church is, at least for their experience? I think I'll probably get into it a little bit later. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I'll say something. I think accepting sometimes are, are congregations that, uh, are okay with having gay people there at their church and but it's kind of a little bit more like the military's uh don't ask don't tell policy where um we're we're happy you're here but we don't want to celebrate and affirm you and um yeah we don't we just don't want to we don't want to draw as much attention to it so i think that's kind of the you know part of that part of that accepting versus affirming conversation yeah, absolutely. I know that uh, that was my experience um, jumping into this. It looks like we have Lindsay back in at least our chat. So let's see, give it like 30 seconds and see if we can get some technology issues sorted out. Can you hear me? Absolutely. Yeah, we can hear you. Um, we, Wonderful. We went ahead and we um, introduced you very briefly. Um, but Perfect. would you like to answer in our first question is just talking about like what makes a church accepting? Um, our next question is going to be about an affirmation, but do you have any uh, perspective on your experience within churches that are just identifying as accepting? Well, I'm not sure what has been said already, but um, my experience is that there's a, there's a big difference between um, uh, being sort of like all folks are welcome here and all folks are affirmed here. Um, and everyone, all of you are frozen again. And so I'm hoping that you can still hear me. Can you still hear me? I can hear you. Okay, great. <laughs> I'm sorry about this, y'all. There's somebody here trying to fix the Wi Fi right now. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, so just like for that that idea of welcoming a sort of you're you're welcome to be here as long as you're like us, um, and affirming is you are um, affirmed in all of your glory just as you are. Thank you so much. Um, 
that really ties into our next question. Can we talk a little bit more clearly on what the difference between accepting and affirming is? Um, if any of you would like to talk either about your experience as a church member or as a clergy member, um, that would be wonderful. It looks like Sherris, we have you marked as kicking us off with this question. Yeah, so I, it took me a long time to um, embrace theology that um, welcomed the queer folk into the full and exuberant love of God. It took me quite a while to get there. And it, in that path, um, I made a lot of friends who had been on that journey before me. And one of them uh, was a pastor's kid, and she kind of always saw herself as going into the pastorate until she finally realized, oh gosh, I'm a woman, that's not going to happen in the denomination that I'm in. And then she knew that she was gay, and she's like, okay, this is really isn't going to happen. Um, but she still wanted to be in church, and so she um, went to a church where she talked to the, the leadership and said, hey, this is who I am. I'm, I'm not in a relationship, but I'd like to be, and is this an okay place for me to go to church? And they were accepting. So they were like, sure, um, come. And within two years, it, I think it took about two years, and the pastor called her in for a conversation and basically said, you haven't changed yet. <laughs> you haven't become not gay. You haven't <laughs> changed your... Um, right. desire to be in a relationship, even though I still don't think she was in one. And they basically said, we, we need you to go. And so it, it was this limit of you can accept, but there's always a limit as how much will be accepted. Um, because it, if God doesn't love the wholeness of an individual who's coming to church, then something is going to hit the fan eventually. And um, it became an actually really big, huge deal. Um, and she actually had that happen in two churches, not just one. Um, so the, the need for an upfront, yes, God is good with the gays and we are good with the gays too, is, um, is kind of really important. Um, otherwise, I, I'm pretty suspicious. Um, because it, it, you can always have church members or a pastor say, oh yeah, Sally comes. She's a lesbian. And, <laughs> um, but if there's no um, upfront comments on the website, if there's nothing spoken from up front, then it is, it is an accepting church and it is not an affirming church. Um, and that acceptance usually has a time limit. Um, it either has a time limit or it has a behavior limit. Um, if you all of a sudden, if you start dating someone or if you want to have a child with someone, then all of a sudden it's like, okay, we were accepting up to that limit. Um, so that's kind of some of the stuff that I've seen and, and heard in my, in my journeying with folks who have gone before me. Thank you. Um, do any of our other panelists uh, want to address that? Um, Lindsay, I don't know if you can unmute yourself. So if you do uh, want to throw anything in, go ahead and raise your hand. I think you can click on participants and raise your hand that way. Um, if you do want to jump in, um, but otherwise, do we have any other notes on that kind of kind of battle of finding that out? Yeah, David. Yeah, and, and I'm sure we'll have opportunity to probably talk about this more in depth later, but um, for me, there's such a challenging question of call. You know, we talk a lot about vocation and call in church circles, at least I do. And, uh, you know, I know a lot of really sweet, faithful queer folk who feel called to stay in churches that maybe aren't affirming or maybe aren't even accepting because um, that's how those communities can change and move. And so, you know, if you're listening to this panel and you're not sure about what that looks like for you, sometimes it can be really helpful to spend some time at a church that is kind of fully accepting, fully celebrating. Um, fully welcoming uh, as a support for, as a way to get clear on, you know, right now I need a church that's all the way there. Right now I can attend a church and do that kind of advocacy work. I think those are both really sacred things. Yeah, good point. Thank you. Um, Kathy, Jewel, or Lindsay, do you want to answer on that or are we comfortable moving on to the next question? 
Looks good. Um, Sharice, you were bringing up something about being upfront and direct, uh, and I think that ties into like, are do any of you know any signs that a congregation is affirming so you don't necessarily have to wait for that? Or do you think that sometimes it's just that waiting game of you can start showing up and uh, eventually you'll start to open it up more? I see David shaking your head. <laughs> <laughs> that just sounds scary to me. I don't know. Uh, my fellow um, clergy folks can can jump in on this, but for me, I've pretty much found that it, if a church is affirming, because it's a celebratory thing, it's upfront. And so it's like, oh my gosh, we love you, because we don't think there's any separation between you and us if you're if I'm not queer and the love of God. So it's kind of a celebratory, yes, yay, we're this way. And so it, it's an asset um, in worship and in in being and so uh, they usually post it uh, somewhere digitally um, and possibly on a banner outside the church so Facebook website Instagram whatever you're gonna see that they've got it there's also um, uh, some markers in in some denominations of kind of um, uh, a, a, a grouping of churches who have gone through um, their own process to be officially welcoming and affirming is kind of the church lingo. Um, and Joel, I'm sure, is going to talk a little bit about that. I know a bit about his church's process, um, not as much as Joel knows. Um, and uh, and, and it, if, if you know the name of that um, group, then you can look for that on websites or you can go to that particular website and look and see what their list of churches is of, of who is welcoming and affirming. In the Lutheran denomination, as Joel will say, it's, it's an organization called Reconciling in Christ. And uh, so if a church is RIC, if they're reconciling in Christ within the Lutherans, that means it's usually a safer place to go as a queer person. Not necessarily always safe, but safer. Yeah, I'll, I'll add, I think, what Shara said too is I think it, it means it's safer, but I think there is a sort of a gradation of, of even within places that are that are um, welcoming and have welcome statements, you know, there, there's sort of a process of growing into being more affirming. Mm -hmm. And so not every place is going to be quite as affirming as as others. But I, I'll say later that it's it's nice when people can give places a chance that are a little further behind um, and help help the process. If it's safe, if it feels safe. Yeah. Yeah. That's me. I'll, I'll just add that I, I think my colleagues and I are, are pretty good about being real upfront about it. I'm wearing my This Queer Pastor Loves You t shirt, like, and I wear it a lot. Um, because the assumption about so many churches is that they aren't going to be a, a welcoming and celebrating space for queer folk, like, the churches that are tend to be really upfront about it. The, the only exceptions are churches that um, are really struggle with technology and so they might just have a real bad website but be really sweet supportive folks um, and uh, but these days most most congregations can handle that and I guess the other thing is uh, if you're part of a denomination or a tradition where there's a pretty hierarchical structure and the overall structure isn't supportive then there might be local congregations that have your back but they have to be kind of quiet about it and so that is a really tricky spot so reach out to one of these pastors if you're in one of those traditions and they can they can introduce you to some folks. That's that's true and I, I will say I did know of a congregation here in Bellingham for a while that was welcoming and affirming but they belonged to a denomination that wasn't and they were receiving funding as a small church and so if they were public about it their funding would be gone and so there there can be some unusual circumstances in, in that regard yeah. But usually just drive by and look for a rainbow flag it yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Um, I would like to move us along. Um, our next question is talking about what the experience is for pushing for your own acceptance and affirmation in religious environments. I know that Sharice, you touched a little bit on it. Um, do you have any more that you want to discuss about like your own experience pushing for acceptance and affirmation? Um, yeah, so um, uh, when I was ordained, I was ordained in a denomination that was not welcome. It still isn't welcoming and affirming. Um, and uh, 
my journey was one of kind of embracing my my sexual identity in more authentic ways even as I was a pastor so um, I, I I made a break with that original denomination part of, actually entirely because of the women in ministry topic that um, I was excluded for the sake of my gender and I I knew that wasn't a battle I was going to be able to take. It was just too big of one. So I was uh, wandered for about six months and ended up with a funky Lutheran congregation in North Seattle and kind of fell in love with them. And the Lutherans really embraced me. And it, I knew that I was going, I'll try and make a longer story a little bit shorter. Um, when I ran into trouble with being a woman as a pastor with my previous faith tradition, it hurt. I mean, it was soul crushing because I had taken a year of, of theological education um, to study the topic and came out on the other side of being like, I think God's okay with this. And if he's, and if God isn't, then I think it's going to be okay. Even when I get to the other side, um, because God is pretty great. And um, so the, the pain that I felt from that, from that um, being pushed out because of a particular theological perspective that I felt wasn't grounded, um, I knew that I didn't want to do that to anybody else. And who were the folks that I would be doing that to? Well, it would have been the queer folk. And so I knew that I was going to be taking a long time to be able to look at that um, theologically. And I did. I took a whole another year to um, consider and talk and read and um, get consults with people who are way, way smarter than me and um, came out on, on, on it, in the middle of that though, I was looking for another denomination and I knew I needed to go into a denomination that was already um, more on the welcoming side because I figured I was heading that way. Um, but in the process, I got there and then I was like, okay, now I actually have an opportunity to work through my own sexual identity because I never have before because I've never been able to do it because all my denominations say this is wrong. So it was, for me, it was um, a theological move based in, I don't want to be excluding because I know how horrible this is for a person. And then once I finally make it to the other side of a group that is actually inclusive, then I could work on me. Um, and it was kind of a tough journey. I mean, I, um, I came out uh, three years ago, um, you know, and, and I'm well, I'm well into my adulthood. Um, so I came out three years ago um, and I knew I needed to come out because I started dating a woman. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I mean, in the meantime, I also, because I was so strongly passionate about having an inclusive congregation, I started a little church that was inclusive. So I could even start a church without, and I, I was an ally, right? I was, I was an ally for queer folk, but I couldn't even necessarily name it for myself. And so it is a really long journey for some folks. For me, it was really long. And um, so I, I needed to push myself through it. Um, and I needed kind and, you know, wonderful people along that journey to, to help me in that path. And I needed to have a lot of folks to be able to talk to. Um, so it was a, it was a bit of a circuitous and a bit of a tortuous path, but it ended up on a, in a, in a good place. Yeah. Thank you. Um, do we, we want to cover that anymore by any of our other participants? Looking good. Um, from here, how can we branch that into pushing for affirmation within churches. Um, Joel, I know that your church has gone through a process to do that. Um, can you speak on that uh, affirmation process? Yeah, um, I'll add first, yeah, the, the campus ministry that I serve was already um, affirming and officially called a reconciling in Christ ministry kind of before I got here, which was great. Uh, but the the congregation that I serve was not. And these two ministries merged together. And uh, being, being that I was uh, in seminary in Berkeley uh, at a seminary that became the first seminary to be a reconciling in Christ seminary in our denomination and had gone through that process, 
uh, once I got here and, you know, I theologically, theologically had a lot of issues with the idea that any church would, would relegate one group to be somehow less than or somehow a bigger sinner just based on their identity uh, when we were talking about grace and God's love for all people no matter what. And so uh, I began preaching that way. And eventually I knew when I got here, I wanted to offer that water to drink, to say, here's, here's the water. You can, you can drink from it, uh, congregation. I think this is the good, the good stuff. Um, you know, let's see what we want to do. And so looking into that, we, we have a process uh, in an organization. They're now called Reconciling Works but they assist congregations that would like to explore being uh, more welcoming and being affirming. And so basically to be a part of reconciling in Christ or reconciling works, your congregation needs to have uh, a council or a congregational vote actually to approve a welcoming statement that is specific in its, in its welcome uh, to queer people. And so getting there to, they have sort of a process and people that can help you do that and uh, i don't want to go on too long but part of it was kind of getting a temperature gauge doing some surveys and then uh, i showed the film for the bible tells me so um with a you know a group showing of that film which is very powerful and then i had a, a class that really focused on you know what does the bible say around this issue or more importantly what does it not say and and, uh, you know, eventually I had some other people come in and talk to the, talk to the congregation. And then we had a, a congregational meeting and we had a vote. And at that meeting, a number of the students that are part of the campus ministry uh, who come to worship on Sunday stood up and spoke, many, a number of, of who are here, and uh, spoke passionately about how their friends and themselves, that this was important, you know, to, to actually say it and, and have a welcoming statement. So here you had, you had young people um, making a difference in a, in a little congregation that has, you know, older folks and, and younger folks, but, but definitely a group of people that were accepting, but why do we have to put it out there? And, you know, here was, here was uh, you know, young people sharing their voice and making a difference. And it's made a big difference. You can just feel it in the air. Uh, I feel better being a pastor at a congregation. I feel uh, better about about the experience and and yeah we're not we're not necessarily all the way to uh, maybe where the UCC was uh, which has been kind of pioneers and and some other Lutheran congregations but we're we're on our way and so um, yeah that's that's pretty much kind of how we're and we had, we had one more thing we had a 93 year old who said why didn't we do this earlier <laughs> so. Yeah, um, you'd be amazed at, at and sometimes it, yeah, it takes it takes courage to try it and to to be a part of a, a group that that you might not be so sure uh, whether they are or not, assuming you feel safe, of course. Have any of the other participants' churches gone through a similar experience, um, either going through that process in particular or going through a different one? I can, I can speak for Garden Street a little bit. It would have been way before my time. They've been reconciling probably for a good 17 years now. So I've only, I'm in my fifth year, so um, long before I got there. And we have a very strong lay, lay contingent that are gay. And so that made it really, really, um, they worked very hard with the congregation, very, very hard with them to get it to happen. When I arrived, um, there was there was still um, a lot of talk about okay we did it because we felt it was the right thing to do but you could tell like Joel had explained there were some hearts that weren't quite there and so um, when I got there we started a, um, a LBGTQ plus group we didn't call it a support group we just called it a group so we could get together and my husband and I they wanted us as gay, straight people for some reason but we'd show up and we spent the first five times meeting together just listening to stories, going around with college students and, and adults, um, listening to stories. Very powerful, extremely powerful. And then all of a sudden we found more people coming because of that, because they go out and talk. 
Well, then the congregation, one woman walks up to me, and she was on 93, but she was pretty close, and, and just said, you know, this is really great, Pastor Kathy. You're bringing in more young people. And then about six weeks later, she walks up to me. She says, I don't like it when they kiss. <laughs> so when we were doing the blessing at the end of service, uh, particularly there's one couple of girls that would kiss, you know, and they didn't like that, and they just, so one family left because this couple was way too physical. And I said, well, well you know, if it bothers you, I, I don't understand why it would, but they're, you know, we're all, it's love is love and we're all loving each other. They kiss because we're blessing. That's part of the thing. You're kissing your husband, right? You know, that kind of thing. So we would have those conversations. And so within a year, we lost probably four or five families because we, we were, we were being a little more visible about it where before it was great. It was great. They were happy. But um, that we had done the process. I wasn't here when that happened. So anyway, so they were way ahead of me in lots of ways and really great ways. But and then and then just last year we journeyed with a college student who began the year as a girl working in the nursery with us, and by the end of the year was a, was a boy. And so the congregation journeyed with him on that. It was really really incredible. And he's still a part of our college ministry, which is great. And the college students journeyed. So this congregation is just really amazing in that way. But it hasn't been, you know, there's bumps. I mean, it's just, um, it's pretty normal. But anyway, and there's going to be more bumps. We have, they call us the Rainbow Church. We have rainbows outside on purpose. We have rainbows on all of our business cards. We have rainbows on everything for that reason. And we, we, we call it our branding, you know, the love people, God world with the rainbow underneath it. And people know right away when they see that. That's who, and we are reconciling. Call it's called Reconciling Ministries Network is what it's called in the Methodist tradition. So, but the higher up is kind of a mess. I'm going to be honest. It's kind of a mess. I wouldn't say kind of a mess. I'd say it's a really, really freaking mess. <laughs> but the churches have really, really great people in them. And really committed pastors that love their people and we're really working you know but we're working through it so anyway there's a lot more of that story but we'll just leave it at that but. thank you um anything else before i move on to our next question All yeah right. i'm sorry mackenzie i'm talking a lot Go but for I, just, it. <laughs> I just want to like um my own experience, um, I, w I was pretty straight passing for the first 10 years or so of my ministry, and that was um, kind of a personal choice, but also a strategic choice based on where I was doing ministry. Um, I was ordained at a little Baptist church in Northeast Ohio in a small town that uh, by consensus, uh, back when I was a college student in that town, so everyone voted for that church to become what they called welcoming and affirming. Um, and so like these are these are congregations across denominations across theological movements uh where folks are digging in it and taking some big risks you know that's uh it wasn't clear we would be able to keep our building um but we decided that we would figure that out these days nobody meets in their church building so maybe that wasn't as radical <laughs> as we thought um i i guess the other thing i would say is um i went back and uh reread some of the history at my congregation so we we became uh, the ucc the united church of christ languages open and affirming we became open and affirming in spring of 1999, but that was after talking about it for nine years. Right. Um, and I think it's not uncommon for a congregation to talk this over for a decade. Um, and my experience of churches is that like, they are slow to move, but then they stay where they're called for a really long time, sometimes for generations. And so if that's you hearing this, you're like, I don't know if my congregation is ever gonna change who they are. Maybe not, but just by being who you are and by being who you're called to be, you change people's hearts and, and you contribute to that growth and blessings to you in, the, in just the ministry of being who you are. Thank you. Um, we have two more questions before we're going to head into kind of an intermission. Um, if you have any questions that you would like us to address in our second, like half second quarter or whatever, um, go ahead and send those to us and we can get onto those. But for now, um, the last two questions we have kind of go together uh, very similarly. Um, it's looking at church members. So those who aren't a part of a clergy, do you have any advice on how um, we can safely, whether we are um, protecting the state, like working on the safety of ourselves or the safety of those around us, 
can you talk on um, how to push religious spaces to be more affirming um, and any like local lifelines uh, that you have around Bellingham that could be helpful in this? Uh, this is kind of an open question. We don't have anybody directed to start, so whoever would like to can go ahead and jump in. Uh, so Whatcom oh. County has a great PFLAG chapter, which is a great support group for you or for your family to come and ask really honest questions about what it means to be queer, what it means to be gay or lesbian or bisexual or transgender. Um, probably your town, wherever you're from, has a PFLAG in it. Oftentimes those are just super sweet committed folks uh, who are willing to have really honest, um, blunt conversations with folks who don't get it or folks who are trying to get it or folks who aren't trying to get it but are just trying to like love their kid. Um, I, I would also say um, in town, we have the Queer Youth Project, um, which su supports young people at least up to the age of 25 um, out of Northwest Youth Services. Uh, my colleague Paige, another great um, queer uh, clergy person, although she isn't clergy in that job necessarily. Um, just there's, uh, if, if you feel like you're struggling or if you feel like you need some community or support, they're great folks to reach out to. That, that was more kind of general. And, and then in, in terms of uh, church support, like I don't care what church you go to. I, I wanna resource you. I, I know that's true of all of my colleagues on the panel here tonight and colleagues of other supportive churches in town. So like, if you never go to my church and just want some prayer for going to your, I don't know, little fundamentalist church, like I got you, we got you. Like that's, that's ministry that we're all committed to. Um, and, and there's probably folks in your denomination that are doing that. So, so like, I got to serve on the board for the uh, Welcoming and Affirming Baptist for six years. And my favorite thing was getting calls from people in little churches in the middle of nowhere or in big cities who are just like, how do I have this conversation? Let me talk to somebody else who's been through this kind of process. Who can I put you in touch with? Like, it's, it's the best. Um, and, and whether you're at a place where you're like, yeah, I'm feeling called to kind of like make some changes or whether you're at a place that just be like, I need to find a place where I can be celebrated or, or somewhere in that mix, um, yeah. I keep preaching, I'm sorry. I'm gonna mute myself and then you can. <laughs> I'd, I'd echo um, PFLAG and Northwest Youth Services and PAGE, um, good, great resources. And just talking with folks. It, if, if you feel like you need to talk to someone, typically calling, calling up a church, contacting a church um, that is really out and, and loud about it and having a chat with the pastor there is, is usually is is usually a helpful thing to do um it certainly was something i needed to do in the midst of my journey i needed to talk to a lot of people who um had a different theological view a more expansive theological view than i did to find out how they got there and everyone has a different story about how they got there um and i actually like the multiplicity of that there's no one way to end up um uh, as as this gay affirming you know queer affirming type type individual um, and hearing all those stories just helped it helped a lot um, and and I like like David I really enjoy having folks um, contact me to have a conversation in the last week I've had two evangelical pastors <laughs> contact me to be like I, I just don't know if I can stay here anymore um, so even even pastors need to talk to folks and so you know, there's, there's a, it's called the body of Christ for a reason, I think, um, that, that we are a body and we need each other to, to get through. Sometimes we need to leave part of the body behind and, and, and kind of team up with, with uh, um, a group that's actually going to be um, inviting and loving. Um, but just resourcing those who are around is it's, it takes a lot of courage to do it, but it can be super helpful. Thank you. Um, if we have no other people who wanna jump in on that, I can move on to our last question. Um, this was talking specifically about uh, online resources. Does anybody have anything before I jump into that? I bet David does. <laughs> <laughs> me too um okay i'm gonna go ahead and jump into our online resources um emma and i both have 
a much longer list of this, uh, but I've got just a quick one that we can go over. Um, if you are a Western student and you want somebody, um, this isn't as much a queer and Christian resource, but it is a really good resource to have. Uh, Langley is with LGBTQ plus Western, as well as the Queer Resource Center on campus are both really good places to talk to. Um, the Queer Resource Center also helps um, host quite a few queer clubs on campus. Um, if you want to know more about the clubs on campus, we do have a list of those and you can reach out to us um, afterwards. Um, we also would recommend looking into like Queer Christian Fellowship and the Reformation Project, which both have panels um, as well as like support groups and promoting of good ways to in, uh, promote inclusion. Um, I would also recommend Queer Theology. Uh, I, it's like a, I subscribe to their email service, which they send daily affirmation. Um, so it's a little quote, whether it's um, a verse from the Bible or a quote from a scholar or a theologist or just a queer person uh, and then it gives some questions on how to reflect on those and last we've got queer uh, oh, church clarity which will it won't have all of the churches but it does show some of the churches in certain areas if they've registered with church clarity it will reflect the views of that church so whether it's like clear that they're affirming or it's like you think they're affirming but it's not super clear um, as well as whether it's clear or not clear that they're non-affirming um, and that's a really good resource if you are moving to a new place and want to get like a quick idea so that you have some starting point within that area um, and that is our first set of questions david yeah you oh, get yeah. a, a that. Uh, I'm sorry, I shouldn't, I spoke too soon. Uh, I just wanted to name, we have five uh, pastors of affirming and supportive churches in town, but th that's not all of the welcoming and, and affirming churches in town. So mm -hmm. uh, th there's, we're blessed to have a bunch in Bellingham. Um, so, so just keep that in mind and, and reach out to the Queer Christian Club. Um, about other folks. Um, and Mackenzie, do you want to say a little bit about who the Queer Christian Club and how people are and how people can get involved in that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Queer Christian Club has existed for going on the third year. I didn't start the club. Emma was one of the founding members um, and they did a lot of really good work. I was a participant of their first year and it was just a location of, um, let's see, the, the goal of it is to kind of bridge the gap between queer circles and Christian circles because unfortunately a lot of the time um, queer people may not feel the most comfortable in certain Christian circles and Christian people may not feel the most comfortable in certain queer circles because there is so much stigma of what happens when you combine the two. So we get together uh, once a week. Uh, I'll say this at the very end as well, um, but Monday nights at 7 p.m. 7.30? 7.30. Uh, we changed our time. We used to be 8 p.m., um, but now we're 7.30. Uh, we do Zoom meetings uh, and we swap between a once a week or once every other week, we do a educational and on the off, bit, off weeks, we do some sort of more social activity um, just to provide a like safe circle for all Christian denominations to gather together and discuss what it means to be both queer and Christian, um, just to just kind of push for that inclusion that we have a space to go. So if you are on campus and you are curious more uh, about it, I will attach um, contact information for our group at the very end. Um, if you're here, then that means that you made it to our Facebook page um, or had somebody send you a link. So you can either talk to the person who sent you the link or you can go back to that Facebook page and send us messages and we can respond through there as well. Um, for now, we're gonna go into like a 10 minute intermission. So we'll come back around. All right. I, we're all here. I think we're good. Thank you for those of you who are still here uh, waiting for us. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started. We've got 
one main question and then we're kind of going to break up into like what how if you want to speak to us uh how you can reach out to us uh, or the churches that are being represented here um to begin we did have uh the the big thing that we wanted to touch on was um for those of you who are lgbtq allies um was what was it that caused you to lead towards that like was it something that you always knew that you were an ally that this should be um that we should be affirming or was it something that changed over time due to different experiences or churches that you grew up in um and then we can jump back in uh lindsay would you like to start us out with that sure so um it's definitely been a journey. You know, I, I came to faith in a really fundamentalist context. And so, um, so I, I was pretty squarely in the non-affirming world um, for a long time. Um, and, and I think what really moved me out of that world, of that camp, was relationships relationships with people with um you know people in my family people in my circles people who i worked with um and hearing their stories and hearing that um uh, you know it's really easy to to be against something when it's when you can abstract it from actual lived lives and from actual people. Um, so I think that was, that was a, a big part of it for me, was just living life with people and hearing stories and um, being uh, really blessed by people who are willing to walk that road with me. Because um, they didn't have to um, at all. And so it was a real, I'm, I'm deeply grateful for um, people's willingness to do that with me. Um, I, uh, I ultimately left the church, a church that I helped plant, actually, um, uh, um, because it wasn't, it was accepting, but not affirming. And it was in a denomination where it was never, it, in, my, in my lifetime, I didn't feel like it was ever going to move there. And so I made the decision to leave um, and, and to move to a church where that was um, affirmed. And so I joined the Episcopal Church at that point in time. Um, and I think uh, the Episcopal Church as a denomination is an affirming one. Um, that being said, individual congregations um, are not always um, St. Paul's, where I minister at now, uh, a number of years ago split over the question, 12 years ago, I think at this point now, um, and over the last 12 years have really made, um, have shifted to a place of, uh, of affirming um, and celebrating folks for all that they are, but it took time. Um, but I think it also came through relationships and lived community. Um, and sharing stories with one another. Thank you. Um, does somebody want to jump in next? Sure, I'll, I'll go. Um, yeah, my, my story, I, I went to high school, in, public high school in Florida, which, you know, in the 80s and mm. early 90s was, was pretty, pretty homophobic atmosphere. And um, I think, you know, some toxic masculinity was, jock culture was kind of abounding there. But I can remember uh, being a camp counselor once I was in college, early 90s, and it was a Lutheran camp, and we went to Key West and did a, a beach camp. And part of the camp was we took uh, young, young people, uh, high school students from the Midwest, to experience Key West. And one of the places where we went was a church that had a, a gay man and a lesbian uh, woman as pastors. And it was very 
very uh, um, eye opening at that time. That was that was kind of a kind of a newer thing, and and I just realized at that time, huh? This this isn't a, this isn't a big deal, and this is why why is this such a big deal? And and then you know later on in my life, I, I worked at a retreat center, um, Holden Village, that that has uh, openly gay uh, affirming attitude and and couples and and married people and that was normalized that was that was normalized this this is how it should be and this is how we expect you to uh treat people and and then i was in seminary in berkeley which was a very affirming place uh but one, one of my one of my classmates who was probably the probably the best candidate to be a pastor in the group took him about three times longer to get a pastor job and I, you know, then, then the justice thing kicks in and that's, you know, that's just wrong. And so um, I think, I think that, that was a big key. And then, you know, theologically, the Lutheran church, we put this big focus on grace and I teach my kids, uh, God loves you no matter what, you know, not, not anything that you do, your unbelief, your behavior, um, God still loves you. There's actually on the wall is a letter from one of my boys that said, says, Joel, God love you no matter what. <laughs> and and so you know I, I I come I come at at that way and you know well what what if one of my sons was gay you know would I want to be a part of a church that didn't fully accept them and love them for who they were yeah <laughs> I'll take it from here from the United Methodist perspective um, it's been about twenty five years now that I've been in the work of um, being an ally um, because a lot of my colleagues that I was very close to were gay and they were they were serving in an institution that they couldn't let anybody know they were many of them were partnered and living with other clergy that were also gay and in relationships and um, it was very very painful to watch them live their secret lives and I was inside their circle so as my husband we go on vacations with them we we're still really like best friends with a, a couple. We they finally got married, but because now it's legal, finally. But anyway, it's um, so it was watching the pain of them trying to live an institutional life and live out their call in the the, the denomination that they loved, and not be affirmed. And they had they couldn't tell anyone, and even like everybody who supervised them didn't want to know because then they might have to do something about it. So. That was extremely, extremely painful to watch. And that's when I became an ally and began shouting about it. And um, I, it's going to change, there's no doubt about that. Um, it's just, uh, that, but that's where it all began. And then I've been serving, in every church I've served, I've had people with a lot of pain sitting in the pews that are, you know, from their families or whatever the case might be that are that are struggling with trying to be accepted because they want to have a relationship with God and they love their United Methodist Church and they didn't want to leave it. And so there was, I've had a lot of congregants I've worked with that way. But this is the very first church I've served that has not been the case. I walked in and they're so open and so accepting, except for the little old lady who didn't like them kissing. But um, it's a, it's a completely different atmosphere in this church, but I think it's because they've been at the work a long time, a whole long time. It could be renewed, there's no doubt about that. There's all kinds of renewal that can always happen. So, but Anyway, that's where I began and continue to continue. Thank you. Um, Sharis and David, can you talk about the struggle, like how you combat coming to affirmation from an internal struggle rather than just seeing it with those around you? Yeah, I mean, I, um, I, I think my story is a lot like Sharice's where like my own queer identity came later in my life or, or the kind of the fullness of that came later in my life. Certainly being out about that came later in my life, such as it is. Um, I'm hoping to live another 700 years. So, you know, um, robot bodies. Um, uh, <laughs> but I'll just say, so, so I think like my story mirrors a lot of my straight colleagues story in a lot of ways, but, but what I'll say about the church I grew up in, um, and, I, and I didn't have language for this till years later, I worked with a street outreach program in Chicago where 
a lot like what Northwest Youth Services does here. The, the youth outreach team talked about one of their program priorities. You know, they wanted to do harm reduction, they wanted to do positive youth development, but they also wanted to do queer fabulousness, uh, which means like, we don't wanna just welcome you in spite of your gender or sexuality or queerness, but because of it. Like that is actively a thing to celebrate, not just a thing that we're okay with. Um, and I think that like, I was, it will not surprise any of you, I was kind of a weird kid uh, there were things about me that my family didn't really know what to do with, that my school didn't really know what to do with, and my like moderate little United Methodist Church in small town Western New York was like, heck yeah, kid, we got a committee for that. Sign us up. Um, we can handle that, and and like it's a gift to us, all of yep. your bizarreness and 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 beauty, and that was so foundational for me, and um, was so redemptive for me that like it continues to be the thing. Like if you are a community that celebrates people for stuff that other people can't handle, then I will go to the mat for you. And that continues to be just, just a through line for my life. There's certainly other things with this particular conversation. Um, I went and pulled off of my office shelf. This is Peter Gomez's book, The Good Book. My best friend mailed this to me when I was a senior in high school and I was like, oh yeah, this. Um, it, was, it was like seeing some commonalities between the theology that I grew up with in my United Methodist Church and some of the conversations about, um, I guess, primarily homosexuality specifically. Um, I, I guess the other thing I'll name is um, just I, like, you know, I wish I could see the faces of the folks here. I, I, it makes sense. And I can't see the faces of the people who will watch this, you know, three and six months from now. But like, I wanna say that there are people who will hear what I'm saying tonight. And so like, let me just speak to you right now. Like, uh, I care a lot about marriage. I love being married, it's the best. But like the thing that just like makes my blood boil is when folks try to keep people from doing ministry. Um, the, the harvest is great and the laborers are few. Like there is so much good work that needs to be done on this earth and in these churches. And to keep people out of that because of their gender or because of their sexuality, like I, I can't handle it. And so I like, whether your call is to ordination or not, just know that whoever you are, I believe that God has a call on your life, whether you like it or not. And so people will tell you otherwise, but they are wrong. Um, and, and, uh, and then just, I wanted to shout out like how great it is to have a pastor who's on board, uh, even if they're not your regular pastor. And I'll just tell the story. So when it was time for me to come out more publicly about my queerness and about my bisexuality, I was like, oh, I should probably tell my family about this, like my parents and my sibling. Uh, so at the time I was going to Echoes and so Sheris was one of my pastors and I was like Sheris can you come over to my house and we'll just like have a little prayer and ring a bell and then I'll hit send on these emails and like I, I because I'm the parishioner there I can tell that story in a way that Sheris can't I guess um, but like that was such a sweet thing and you know it wasn't necessarily about what she said but just like a willingness to literally stand there and be in the room with me during that, you know, like my family was like, sure, fine, whatever. But like, just that, that um, hat, someone to, to stand for, like Jesus was in the room for me and it was helpful to have an actual human to come stand in the room with me. Um, and I think pastors are good for that among many other folks. Yep. Mm -hmm. and, and David beat me to it. Like David did that before I came out. So yeah. <laughs> Thank you, David. I'm, I'm, I'm a front runner, Sherris. You lot. are. You are. So many ways. So many get excited ways. to get really enthusiastic about Marvel Comics any minute now. That's the <laughs> Oh, Joel, I've been looking at your like sepia tone kind of hue thing. I feel like I've got a bit of a presidential hue right now. So I think it's a little bit weird and it's a little unsettling, unsettling for me. Um, Anyway, uh, my story, <laughs> I'm going to get into specific theology because that is yeah. kind of a big deal for me. So I'm like, okay, I know the plight of some folks who have been squished and smushed and just kicked to the curb by church and church folk, but what about the Bible? Yeah. And um, <clears throat> one of the most formative conversations I had was with a Catholic priest who was a friend. And Joel knows this person too. We, we all did hospital chaplaincy together. And um, I, I went and had a conversation with him. I'm like, okay, because he is, he's gay, he's celibate uh, because of his priesthood vows. He wouldn't be otherwise. Um, and I'm like, okay, how, how, did, how did you come to this conclusion that this is like something theologically okay? And um, he said, well, uh, 
if you look at all of the texts that are somewhat speaking about homosexual acts, um, there's not very many of them, he goes, all of them are actually about idolatry, lust, or power. Those are the things they're about. And what, what is happening in the midst of those still wouldn't be okay today. It doesn't necessarily have, have something to do with, with the, the actual act of homosexuality, but it has to do with the fact that those instances were about something other than the sex. And he goes, and the rest of the Bible doesn't say anything about what we know as, you know, loving, you know, consensual relationships between um, adults that are, you know, fruitful and nourishing and all of that. And that was like, oh, literally that was one massive piece of the puzzle for me because those texts are proof texted all the time. And if you look at the issue behind it, is the issue the sex or is the issue around what the sex is um, pointing towards power, lust, or idolatry. And that really made a huge difference um, for me. And I, I think it helped make a lot of other things um, fall into place. And, and also my seminary education really gave me a value for the trajectory of scripture. And looking at who Jesus was welcoming in, um, he was welcoming in everyone who'd been pushed to the side. And he just kept doing that and kept doing that and kept doing that. He, um, in, the, in the lectionary that we're in right now, the, the order of Bible readings within the Lutheran denomination, we have a four week cycle of Jesus basically blasting the religious authority and saying, hey, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are getting into the kingdom of God ahead of you. Yeah. <laughs> and and who, who were the tax collectors and the prostitutes today? Well, there's still the tax collectors and the prostitutes, but you can add on the queer community, right? And so Jesus kept bringing in all these folks who'd been kicked to the curb and ostracized and deemed as completely unclean. And he kept bringing them in, kept bringing them in. And I'm like, he didn't necessarily have any queer folk that he was able to, to bring in at that time, um, or it's not just listed in scripture. Um, and, and so the trajectory of who he was and what he was doing it's going to include those folks who keep getting kicked out by the religious authorities. Amen. So it, it made some, some theology was huge for me to have it, have it fall into place. And um, so that's part of my story as well. And, and, and like, I love to argue about the Bible. So like whoever you are listening to this, it's like, man, I really need to call up a pastor and argue about the Bible. I don't get to do that much in the UCC because it's less of a stressful thing for us. So I've got some like, Mm, let's rumble about Leviticus energy, but like if you do, <laughs> then I get to talk to you about all the times I see P Jesus explicitly welcoming queer folks. Because I'll, I'll, I'll like actually step in there, Sharers, and say like, no, I, I think actually uh, in the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament both, there's a lot of folks who are queer coded for their historical context uh, mm -hmm. that Jesus welcomes, that are people of God, that are ministers of God's grace and love. And uh, like, I, if 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 I can contend with uh, some of the like stone throwing passages, then I think my conservative colleagues have to contend with, you know, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch, or uh, yes. Ruth and Naomi, or or take your pick on yep. down the line. Yep. Um, <laughs> but seriously, no, I will like buy you coffee or beer. Uh, I don't know how to do that over Zoom, but I'll find a way. <laughs> If you want to argue about scripture with me, I love that stuff. <laughs> Kathy has well, for a living, so call me who can do it. For I love time. it. I love it. Well, I think <laughs> there's all kinds of gay people in the Bible, all kinds of them. We can name all kinds of stories, but anyway. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, we are kind of hitting our time here. We've got like nine minutes left. So can we run through? Um, and if people want to take you up on that offer of like talking about theology, um, can those who are comfortable having that conversation or want to talk a little bit more about how they can contact your church, can we go through and like, I know David, you're really excited. So if you'd like to start and then like pass it down the line, can we talk about, uh, just a real quick, how people can contact you if they have questions or, um, contact your church if they have questions. Yeah, and, and this is a great time to try out some worship services um, because 
all of ours are only on Facebook. So you do have to go on Facebook, which is kind of terrible. But um, if you're willing to do that, sometimes they're on our website too. It's a process. Um, but we're at facebook.com slash FCCBUCC or FCCB.net. Uh, so First Congregational Church of Bellingham.net. We got .net because we had a website before it was cool. I just want to say that. Um, um, and yeah, you can find my contact info there. Um, uh, but, but like, it's, it's a lovely time. Like when I check out a church, sometimes I love to just like go and sit in the back and leave early so that nobody knows I'm there. And this is a lovely time to be able to do that. Um, and you can do that in three or four services over the course of an hour. Um, if you're willing to kind of click around, um, it, it's so hard to find a congregation and my prayers are with people who are looking for a supportive church, uh, or, or other kind of community. I, I think the queer Christian club is a great supportive community for Western folks but just blessings in your search. I'm gonna throw it to Sheris. So, um, echoesbellingham.org is how you can reach Echoes, which is Bellingham based. And we, we, uh, we run things a little bit differently so there aren't a whole lot of worship services to look through. And we're even a little bit slow on, on putting our uh, Monday night gatherings up, but we do meet on Monday nights. Um, you can find my contact information um, on the website and any of the four folks who, uh, who work with Echoes at this point in time. Um, I don't think I've, I don't think there's many, yeah, we don't have many traditional worship stuff up there, um, but it's an interesting site to poke around. Um, yeah, and one other thing I do want to mention before I before I get off here, I, I am an interim pastor at at what I mentioned was a traditional Lutheran church, and it is not reconciling in Christ, and yet I am queer and I am a pastor there, and that church, to its credit, um, decided to. It, and I'm an interim, meaning I'm I'm gone, like I'm not staying, and so it's it's easier to say, okay, come on, we'll we'll take her, um, and, um. But the church, there was enough folks on the council to say, we want to be honoring to our, um, one of our values of welcome. Like they literally have that as part of one of their values. And it's like, well, are we really true to that? Let's, let's try this out. And so part of what I do there is I just be a pastor and, and I'm not, I'm not pushing that. That's one of the things I, I don't feel like I have the liberty to do in my congregation right now, partly because it's not in my job description is what I'm doing. But me just living out my life as uh, un unashamedly um, a bisexual pastor changes things. Um, I've had a number of people be able to, to tell me, um, I didn't think women could be pastors until I got to know you and watched you be a pastor and I've changed my mind. So a lot of times it doesn't even have to do anything about theology. It has to do with experience. And um, so, so living out who you are can be making changes in people around you that you don't even know. Um, so that's kind of cool. And so if you want to see uh, sermons from a grace perspective in a church that isn't welcoming and affirming, you can find that one too. It's Our Savior's Lutheran in Arlington. Next. You have to call on somebody or something. Oh, I do. I'm sorry. Kathy, my bad. Kathy. <laughs> If you were just to Google Garden Street United Methodist Church, you would find our website pretty quickly and my contact information will pop up. Um, also, we, are, we have YouTube, we have a YouTube channel, which we didn't have until COVID hit and everything. There's a plethora of videos to see. We do a Wednesday connections and a worship service every, every week on there. So a lot to see there. Um, also, one of my, I'm just going to throw this out there because one of my gifts with working with um, particularly young people who are, who are um, experienced, particularly at Western. That's why our, my husband is the director of college ministry and I'm the pastor. So we end up, I work with the students as well. I just love them. They're just great. And is a lot of them, their families have not reconciled with what's going on in their lives. And particularly the young man who was a girl and now is a boy. It, it, he had a rough year last year. It was really rough and had a really rough summer. My gift is walking alongside some of these kids, and maybe it's because I'm older, I don't know, but and um, being with them and helping them understand, you know, their love and, you know, what God means to them, and, and they need to talk about their parents and their families and their grandparents and their, 
So that's something that for some reason I keep being called to do, which I, I'm thrilled to do. Yeah. If it's all part of the process. It's all part of it. So anyway, but we leave it at that. <laughs> and, and Joel. Okay, um, I'll plug Lutheran Campus Ministry first at Western, and uh, we're a club on campus, and we are Lutheran in name, but we have people that are a part of our ministry that come from a very wide variety of backgrounds, and I think what they're attracted to is is the people in our group. We have some great students, but but also, you know, we're, we're really just centered on this idea that God is love, and we have it on our t-shirts. And God is calling us to work together uh, for a better world. And and um, yeah, and and we ask a lot of questions, and we we have Bible study on on Wednesday evenings, uh, and sometimes we we've had a book study uh, about race in the church. Uh, during non-COVID time, we get together in person. Believe it or not, uh, a lot of a lot of, a lot of believe it or not. <laughs> <laughs> we, we take trips together, uh, retreats and, and whatnot. Um, the, the congregation that I serve, Our Saviors Lutheran, we're in Happy Valley. And um, our, our website is, is wonderful, um, but it might be a little bit um, uh, not current at the moment. But um, yeah, things are changing. And give me a call um, or send an email. Go to, go to, to Lutheran Campus Ministry's uh, website, which, which is great, too. Um, I'm going to pass it off to Lindsay. Hey, y'all. Um, so I, uh, I work with um, uh, Episcopal Campus Ministry. We, we call ourselves EPIC. Um, and the website for that is epicwwu.org. You can find out more information about us there. We, um, we currently meet on Sunday evenings for worship for an hour and then um, Tuesday evenings for um, discussion um, also for about an hour. We, we felt like our Zoom time was getting maxed out when we were meeting for more than an hour. So we've split it up. Um, so the information can, for that can be found um, on our website. And so we, um, that's, that's a place to, to connect with us there. Um, on St. Paul's, our website is stpaulsbellingham.org. Um, and that's St. abbreviated, not spelled out. Um, that's a little confusing. Um, and so like street um, Pauls. <laughs> what was that? So like street Pauls. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, and uh, we, uh, we meet uh, every evening for Compline at 8 p.m., um, which is like, it's just a really brief end of the day closing prayer service on Facebook Live, um, which is facebook.com backslash St. Paul's Bellingham. Again, abbreviated, it's Saint. Um, and then Sunday mornings at 10. Um, we are, uh, we're, we're the only Episcopal church in town. Um, and so we're a lot larger than most Episcopal churches usually are, which is quite was quite puzzling for me when I got there. It was like, this is and what's going on? Um, but um, yeah, so we're, you, if you look down Holly Street, downtown, the church you see at the end of the road is St. Paul's. And so that's us. Thank you all so much for joining us. I want to be able to get you out of here because we are hitting 830. So let me Really quick, Emma, is our email www.qcc or is it qccww? <laughs> oh, they're muted. I check that for Epic each time. Just, I don't remember which one. Wqcc. Wqcc. But if you got here, then you either had somebody send you a link or you saw our Facebook page. So you can also just look up. WW Queer Christian Club on Facebook or Instagram. David has confirmed it's WWQCC at gmail.com. So you can also reach out to us through there. If you're interested in um, coming to one of our meetings, we also meet on Monday. We meet Monday at um, 730 uh, through Zoom. If you're interested in that, send us a message and we will send you the link so that you can join us. Um, but other than that, thank you all for joining. Keep in mind that this is recorded. Um, so if you realize that you didn't like 
change your name and you should have, you can always email us and we can see what we can do and see if that's a possibility that we can edit it. Um, otherwise, this will be posted on the QCC's Facebook page and probably um, links can be found through any of the wonderful members who helped us out. So thank you not only to the participants, but also to our audience members. And I hope you have a good weekend. Have a good Thursday, beginning of October. Look at that. Version poster. Oh, okay. It's old school. It's like 20 years old now. So it's. Oh, what old. happened? David, what happened to your hair while you were gone? <laughs> it's something. I was literally running. It's, it's <laughs> super far to the bathroom. And so. Oh, yeah. This is going to be great on the YouTube video afterwards. I might edit <laughs> that out. The 10 minutes of nobody here. <laughs> Just a bunch of black squares. That part I'll definitely edit out. The question is whether I edit out like us messing with the technology for a while. <laughs> Look at that. Five pastors and you ended on time. Mackenzie, you are a legend. <laughs> Thanks, y'all. Let's see all the pets in the room. Let's everybody put your pets on camera. Mine mine walked away. Wow.